Kia ora and welcome to Sobriety Chat. I am your host, Lotta Dan, otherwise known as Mrs. D. I am the community manager and content creator here at Living Sober. And today I'm joined by the gorgeous, as you can see, Carmel Claridge. Uh, now, Carmel is many things. She's a partner, a mum, a daughter, a sister, a very proud grandma of four delicious grandbabies. Uh, she has a legal background, which she's currently using um, in her role as a court coordinator. We'll hear more about that. And of course, she is a sober hero. Welcome, Carmel. Good <laughs> Thanks for thanks for having a chat with me today. Oh, it's so been, so fun, good. Because we we met at a work hui last week and we had a brief chat and I just had the sense of oh I want to talk to her more and so it's really great and you know for our members at Living Sober many of whom are in those early stages of quitting they're kind of grinding through those tough you know phases at the start um they just love hearing from people who are further down the track so how long have you been sober for 14 years amazing <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and yeah I, I, it, it's still a case of pinching myself um almost every day about how great my life is um um, today, as a sober woman, yeah, it's um, it's been a um, an incredible journey. Um, I've had some highs and lows, of course, such as life, but um, it's it's brought me to a really, really wonderful place in my life. Yeah, so Amazing. cannot right. speak highly enough of living a sober life. I know, and if we could bottle bottle this feeling and you know sell it, um, we'd be rich women. But do you mind if I take you back a little just to um, share a little bit about your story and what got you into recovery? Um, you know, as much as you or as little as you want to share, how did your drinking story go? When did you start and how did it develop across um, Oh, life? gosh. <laughs> I remember very vividly the, the first time I got properly savagely drunk. Um, was that my mate? Tracy's house, Springfield Road, St Albans and Christchurch, where I was living at the time. Um, I was in the full form at school, so I would have been about 14 uh, years old. Uh, we had um, we had a house to ourselves, no parental supervision. Um, the group of kids would have been between the ages of 13 and 15 and a room full of booze. Yeah, mm. and um, yeah, there, there were so many things about that night that were so horrible, so horrible. Um, I, bro I broke Tracy's mum's antique table, the one nice piece of furniture um, that she had, snapped it in half by jumping on it, um, spent a good part of the night throwing up, you know, in a big stainless steel cooking bowl on the couch and... Um, then someone said, "Oh, have this, have this. It'll make you feel better." And it was, um, it was um, Karuba, um, What was that? Karuba rum oh, and yeah. Coke. Can I remember Karuba rum? So got drunk, threw up, but then started drinking again, so I could get buzzy again. Um, yeah, and um, as I said, you know, so horrible in so many ways, and and yet. Um, I yearned to do it again, you know, I wanted to do it again as soon as I could. And from then on, pretty much my um, my weekends were, you know, where's the party? You know, where's the party where I can go for it with the booze? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, that went on for a long, long time. And drinking was very normalised for young people um, in my peer group. Um, getting into pubs underage wasn't a problem. Christchurch in those days. Um, I was first, first caught underage at the age of 15 at the Hillsborough Tavern. Oh, <laughs> I remember the Hillsborough Tavern. I was caught underage at the, what was it called in the summer? No, it was the Heathcote Inn. Oh, the, oh. <laughs> and then there was. We're, a, from, we're from the same neighbourhood, so it would have been the Caledonian. The Caledonian, the Charlton, oh, yeah. I don't, oh yeah, and there was one in the square. Now, what was that called? It started with a W with the Irish band. Corners. 
We probably yeah. bumped into each other, honestly. We were probably here together, same time, same place. And just like yeah. you, I was the same. The minute I touched it, I loved it. And mm. it just did what I wanted. And I understand what that is now that I'm in my 50s and in recovery. But at the time, I didn't know. I thought it was just being cool and fun. I didn't yeah. realise the other impact it was having on me. But let's get to that stuff in a minute. How did it go for you? So it was all fun and games and partying. Was that through your 20s and 30s? How did things track for well, you? No, not, um, well, of course, university was great. I, I designed my whole um, curriculum around happy hour, um, the $1 drugs. Um, but drinking and um, drinking and, and doing life, I was able to juggle at that stage. So I was still, got, you know, tracking through life really well and achieving really well and and uh, you know got a couple of degrees under my belt and um academically was always very sort of up there and and kind of i guess in many ways certainly within my family was looked as as being oh she's she's the successful one you know she's the one who's going to do really you know important things and she's going to be you know top of her field and everything and my my siblings loathed it of course oh, perfect caramel <laughs> Yeah, so um, I married very young, um, had three children quite early in life, um, became almost by, and I'm not sh quite sure how this happened, um, but fell, in, fell into, it, would, it was my choice as well, but became a very traditional stay-at-home mother to a high-achieving partner as they worked their way up the legal ranks. Um, and again, alongside that still was drinking and yahooing and um, brief periods where I stopped when I was pregnant, but only because I was horribly um, sick, you know, had morning sickness. It wasn't out of any great concern for, for my children. Um, I, I still did things then in, in my 20s, early 30s that, were, in hindsight, were, were really dysfunctional. I drove drunk with babies and toddlers in the car. I'd, I'd turn up to play groups, um, sometimes with a couple of bottles of wine, hoping that, you know, the other playgroup mums would would join me and occasionally they did um and I'd be sort of three sheets the one you know by five o'clock I was kind of well and truly pissed um yeah um and in those days drinking a lot was almost celebrated particularly in the culture w w where I in which I kind of loved that the, the the legal fraternity um you know and the the friday night drinks and the the partners retreats and in all um, of our society let's be honest i mean you know by this stage alcohol's in the supermarkets it's readily available everywhere and cheap i mean we yeah. are in an environment of this is a normal thing everyone and does it, it and the people who didn't drink and i remember a couple um who and they were christian and they didn't drink for for their own reasons but I can remember the ridicule that they used to get at yeah. functions <laughs> yeah um it was quite pathetic really um this is going back a long time you know this is 25 years ago or so but um you know I hope that we've come a bit further along I, mean, the track. I think it's shifting there's still pockets yeah. where, where you do get, you know, like I always say, it's the only drug that you're judged for not taking. Taking it. No one questions um, if you decide that, no, actually, I'm not going to have um, uh, have pee today or I'm going to, yeah, you know, right. <laughs> What do you yeah. mean you're not having heroin? Um, <laughs> but, Carmel, I want to go back because I just had this image of you, this kind of, you know, studying and degrees and marriage and babies and and wine and when you look back at that woman you know who was ticking all the boxes of oh, life yeah. you know whoop success success doing everything mm -hmm. being the perfect person that you you know been pitched as from a young age how do you feel about her and how she was actually feeling inside because it sounds like there was a lot going on and you were sort of somewhat lost in that, I don't know. You, I was completely you... lost. I had no idea who I was. Um, I, you know, all of that external validation that I was desperate for, it was all about the um, the, the portrayal of, you, you know, let's make everything look good, you know, right down to going to the gym all the time obsessively, so even your body has to be perfect. So creating this image, and yet inside, and I used to, 
remember once at the gym, someone said to me, oh, everybody's so envious of you. And I felt like, you have no idea how rotten I feel inside. You have no idea. So externally, I had everything, right? Internally, I was I was lost. I, I had no sense of purpose in my life. I didn't know who I really was. I, I felt like I was living a life that was completely out of kilter with my values. I'd kind of parked all of my sort of personal ambition in a way in the sense that, oh, you know, I, you know, Matthew's doing all that for me. I don't need to do that anymore. And I'd become very, I, I guess, sort of, um, I was carried along by life rather yeah. than, so I was like I was on an escalator that I had no power over myself or no control over myself. And life was just something that happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of that is, you know, I can't, blame others for that a lot of that was it was easier to do that so I took I took that part yeah you yeah know, I didn't have to work so I didn't um yeah. I didn't ha you know I, I could ha ha I, don't, I don't know it was yeah but then but then I became increasingly angry and resentful Mm. But my default feeling for most of that period of time was sad. I was sad all the time. You know, I was sad and disappointed in myself all the time. Mm. Um, and never felt that I was um, doing something worthwhile. So yeah, alcohol was great in that it, it kind of, it, it. It worked. Well, it made you feel, I mean, it, it just made me feel better than myself. Yeah. I think um, oh, I get exactly what you mean. Yeah. So, what happened? What happened? How did you get to where you're How now did... in a different life? What, no, the, well, the what wheels. Was the point of change. The point of change. Um, I, I, I think there, like my, like most people, I have those kind of life markers which will push you in one direction or the other. And um, my my first marriage failed, um, and I was on my own. Um, trying to negotiate life now as a single woman with three young children had had a huge gap away from the workforce. Oh, I dabbled, Lotta. You know, I dabbled. I'd done the, the, the rich housewife kind of little bits on the side here and there, but not proper, not, not real sort of career path work or anything like that. So struggling to get back into some kind of means of looking after myself. Um, and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get my shit together. I was hopeless. I was useless. You know, <laughs> and look, admittedly, it was, um, you know, it was a very, very difficult few years. The, um, the, the, the extricating myself from the marriage was difficult and there were legal proceedings involved. It was enormously stressful. And parenting is relentless and a <laughs> thing. And I didn't do what I should have done, which was to, you know, ask for support and help and lean on my friends and and look after myself. My 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 coping mechanism was those, of course, you know. So off I went, and there was no handbrake anymore. So I had no one to sort of roll their eyes or tut tut or, you know, no nobody to sort of question what I was doing. So off I went, um, and oh boy, did I go for it. So yeah, that 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 was when that was when things really escalated. Um, yeah, um, my mental health became very very poor. So I'd struggled with depression um, when my children were younger, um, but during this phase, my mental health it, it it really did deteriorate in a way that was quite disturbing. But at the same time, I didn't get proper help with that mm. and self-medicated um, yeah. using alcohol which of course exacerbates it so yeah things were really starting to get bad um, I was so lonely I was so <laughs> I mean it was just such a horrible time um, and the only way I could deal with the, the feelings of the terrible feelings of failure because of course I outwardly had this yeah. And had every, I mean, you know, materially, I'd gone from a, you know, really, really high earning household to next to nothing. Mm. Um, I managed to get, I managed to get myself um, a job back in law as an older woman returning to the workforce, essentially working minimum wage. 
um, out at South Auckland. And I had my little boy in daycare and had to struggle to get there in time and paid late fees every... My mom and my girlfriend said, oh, you'd be better off on the DPB, girl. You know, what are you doing? But I, I really did try really hard to get my life back together. I really yeah. did. But alongside of that was my alcoholism. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Um, so what got you out? What got me out? Oh, gosh. Um, 14 years ago, what was the thing where you uh, were there was not one, there was one thing. I, I, I chucked in the proper job. Um, I, I gave up, really. Um, I gave up even trying to, to live life normally. And I had a couple of years that were, uh, I call it my twilight zone. So I yeah. started doing, I started, it was almost like I'd, I'd given up even trying to, to rebuild a life I, I, I my yeah. self-worth was nothing um, so lost. my older children had got sick to death of me they didn't want anything more to do with me not really um and besides you know I by that stage I was very mentally unwell um I was behaving very strangely um dipping into sort of psychosis and taking whatever was around that was on oh. offer um I'm so lost it's just like hearing this and looking at you now and you just you know and you're just so sort of gorgeous and groomed and articulate oh, just no, 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 this. I'm so yeah so I, I i there's a film called Leave, leaving las vegas and there's yeah. a um, nicholas cage and it shows um what the show <laughs> what the show it's just my partner putting the piss, the shiny BMW, and, and he's getting rid of, he, he's divesting himself of his past so that yeah. he can go to Las Vegas and drink. And when I watched that movie in recovery, I just wept because that was me. I sold my house. I put all my belongings in storage. Um, I, I I was, no, the, this was after I'd been sectioned and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd given up well and true. Yeah. But my life became... Um, I didn't really have a life, Lotta. I, it was like I was getting ready to leave. Yeah. So my furniture was in storage. I'd sold my house. Um, I also was – I had no proper income. You know, I was cleaning the odd sort of person's house and that sort of thing. But I was living off credit cards, selling jewellery, um, lived – it was chaos. I, so I no longer had a home, okay, Um and I was just careering around and bounced around various men and, and um, became very, very disconnected from reality. Very disconnected. Um, but I can see, looking back, I was quite systematic in, in getting rid of anything that required any sort of responsibility from me, from myself. Right. I can remember my, um, my youngest son was still kind of talking to me. And I remember being at a bar on a Friday about... So, and I, I remember his his little um, name coming up on my phone and I just went and put it down. And the saddest thing is I didn't feel anything. So I didn't feel How anything. Can you? How can you when you're that numb from the alcohol? Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. I remember when we met you saying that your drinking was kind of an out of the house around bars, whereas mine oh, was, I was inside God, behind I was... closed doors. Mm. So by the end, I was out there and, you know, I was regularly getting picked up by the police and taken back to wherever I was staying at the time and um, getting into fights, breaking things, um, driving around, drunk as a skunk. Mm -hmm. um, um, so became I, I became the sort of person that I used to look at with contempt and disdain. I was a bar hoe. You know, I was a sad middle-aged barho, um, and yeah, that was just oh, yeah. I didn't care. I didn't yeah. care. Um, nothing mattered to me anymore. I I was you know I, I was totally oblivious. It was just like ah, what ifs. Yeah. So I was ready to go. You know, I was ready to go. It was I was just waiting for something to take me out. Quite frankly, Lotta, you know. Um, I had a nice little stash of pills by this stage too that I used to cut. That's like, you know, my little stash that I was slowly yeah. building. Um, so yeah, I was um, in my own strange way being quite methodical. I even gave away my dog. Mm. Yeah, 
go yeah. ride my dog. No, 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 no. I can't be looking after a dog anymore. Yeah. Um, so there was nothing that I didn't, I no longer had any um, reminders of my family. So any photos and whatever gone. So all yeah. I had was, um, you know, the, the bag of the makeup, the bag of makeup, a couple of suitcases of my clothes and my shoes in my car. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I'd sold my house, so I had access to money. So I was and just cutting off everything that had mattered because you didn't want to feel the pain. The pain I, didn't want, I didn't want any anchors to remind me of what a shit heap yeah. my life was. You know, I didn't want reminding. And that's the thing about people will often um, go to go to detox or go to um, a, a rehab or whatever. But the problem is you've got to be prepared to face that wreckage. And I believe it's looking at the wreckage in the cold heart light of, light of day will drive most people back to the drink because you don't yeah. want to face it. It's like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Yeah. How, I don't want to look at it like that. Um, so I was disassociated completely. So I'd watch myself kind of doing all of this weird, chaotic, dysfunctional, crazy woman stuff. So I, I was like, I was watching myself and I'd become like, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, you're doing that now. Oh, that's kind of weird. Oh, but oh, hey. Gosh. So yeah, it was my way of separation. Yeah, completely separated. So it was like I was watching a movie of myself mm. um, in my last, in my last days of drinking. So uh, what happened? Okay, so Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, by this stage, I'd become quite a, quite a violent person. Um, it was not unusual to um, get into physical fights, um, particularly with men. And um, there was a guy that I was seeing, and I went around to his house, and we had a big fight. And I remember him, we were fighting, and we were on the stairs, and he was sort of trying to push me down the stairs. I remember kind of going limp and looking up at him and just saying, oh, for heaven's sake, just kill me. Just do it, just kill me. And it was just like everything kind of went silent and he kind of went, he even stopped and went, what the f And I kind of picked myself up, got myself home. The police arrived. Um, the police arrived at the place I was staying. Where was I starting? I can't even remember. But the police arrived and sat down and and I I don't I can't really remember what I said, but they left. And I woke up in the morning and I was sitting sitting there and there was a Eastern Bay Courier. Do you remember those Eastern Bay Couriers? Yeah. Yeah, those little suburban. And I was I was sitting there and I was looking at my fingernails. As you see, I've got fake fingernails because my and there were coils of hu bloodied human skin under my fingernails. And I was looking at them, and then I looked down, and there was a little ad for AA. Oh. And I picked up my phone, and I rang the number. Oh. And that was having a drink something. Yeah. So that, I, I talked to that guy, and his name was Dave. And um, Dave was lovely, Dave at the service centre. Um, and he said, where do you live? You know, where do this you stay? This is the AA guy. The CIA guy at the service centre. And he said, there's a meeting tonight at um, Victoria Rav um, in Rimuera. Um, can you get yourself there? And I said, yeah, yeah, I can get myself there. And he said, look, if you can't get yourself there, someone will come and pick you up and take you. And I said, no, 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 it's all right. I can get myself there. And I thought, oh, someone's going to pick up me and take me, really? Mm -hmm. And um, But what yeah, an well, amazing sense of, of care right from the get-go that someone would do that, you know, that you were, there was something there. But what I'm loving hearing is how you were doing everything in your power to end it, leave it, but there was some part of you that went, no, when right at the point where you'd gone, just just take me out, kill me now. I'm done. Stick a fork in me. That, that, that next day that made that call that was like, we're keeping you here. And then you started to fight. Yeah. Yeah, I, I look. I can't. It, it's it's inexplicable by any kind of scientific metrics. Um, it was a chain of a really small little what I call my little miracles, my little chain of small miracles. The 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 miracle that Dave answered that day, and Dave being Dave, and if new Dave was very very passionate um, about the work he did at the service centre, and a very 
you know, passionate member of the fellowship and um, a very caring and loving guy. And um, yeah, and, and the people, when I arrived at the funny little um, citizens advice place in Vicky Ave and walked in, beans, you know, it was Albert actually. Oh. He's actually become a really good friend. He's <laughs> one of these friends of my partner. So life's so weird and it's coincidence. And he said, Welcome, come in, come in. Oh. Um, Albert's a Cook Islander and he just has that natural sort of sense of, you know, making people feel welcome. Oh. He was the person at the door, come in, come in. And I went in and people were just, I don't know, people were just lovely. And it was just, I just felt a sense of, oh. I'm going to be safe here, I, you know, I, I, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and the things that, you know, I can't remember exactly what was said, but that just that feeling in that funny little room with the grotty little chairs and all these people, you know, various ages and and um, mostly white because it was a meeting in Rimuera, but, you know, from all different backgrounds and yeah. just sitting there and just the, the sense in the room of we've got you, yeah. you know, it's okay, we've got you, so... Yeah, the it's, beginning. It's the hope and the warmth and the acceptance, and you find it in the rooms and you find mm -hmm. it online. And to be honest with you, mm -hmm. Carmel, that is the sense that we also have in, in our community here on the site because people come in and we're online and we're typing to one another and we don't always know who each other is, but there's always this welcome. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. Yeah. And that's and why we love it. And there's hope, and I'm not going to tell you how to do it because if anyone no. said you must do the blue, I would have gone off. Oh, fuck off. Yeah. Um, just like here's my story, you know, and and you hear you hear yeah. your own story and the stories of others, and just the cut that the non-judgmental space where you can be totally yourself. And I can remember in those early days. I used to. I was so jittery, you know. I'd, I'd mm, sitting yeah. still for an hour was a real big ask for me, and I'd sort of bob up and down and be in and out and nobody batting you know people didn't bat an eyelid yeah um, and whatever you disclosed or told or said it was just never oh, you know there was never any shock or horror yeah. it was just this, oh yeah 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 we we get it um and I was very very fortunate in that I was immediately surrounded by um some very very um strong women in recovery um I'd I'd, I'd had very bad relationships with men, you know, really dysfunctional, um, often violent and often very weird um, interactions with men. So the women were particularly good to be able to gravitate towards and, and feel safe with. Um, I got a sponsor. I went through several sponsors in the beginning, um, but eventually got a sponsor who, who, who was very diligent about... Um, helping me through the steps, doing the actual yeah. steps. Um, so it became for me, I, I, I'm a fast learner. And if you give me a project, I'm like, yeah. I die. Yeah. Um, so you so put I, all your I, energies into this work. Oh, oh man, I dived in. I dived in. I went out, you know, I went out within a week. I had a new phone, so I didn't have my old contacts. So I, yeah. well, I was tempted to, you know, go back to that world. I bought a house to live in I got my my stuff out of storage I started Amazing. making a home um and I gave myself I said you've got three months you're not going to worry about money because I was always sort of you know I, and I made a real mess of you know my finances and luckily was left with enough to to get my own home but I you know I had no income coming in at that stage so I was really scared about that but I said no you, you've got three months we're gonna we're gonna do this AA stuff and get that embedded and then you're gonna worry about that so for three months I basically all I did was go to AA meetings um I took up running um and I smoked <laughs> furiously pack of fags a day um I did my own detox I was a bit naughty um I, so I had my um um Valium derivatives to to cope with yeah. the, um, the, the the insomnia and the DTs and things, so I slowly mm. titrated the dose for that because, of course, I'm a I'm a smart ass know all and I can you know, amazing. <laughs> just, oh, and all those resources that you'd been putting into the chaos, you then put into the repair. I put into the, yeah, the uh, doing the fellowship. Yeah, mm. I remember sitting. I remember sitting. It was very very early on, and I 
you know, the steps are up on the wall. And I remember focusing on step two and just saying over and over and over again, came to believe the power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, came to believe the power could restore Because for me too, it was my mental health and losing, yes. my, um, my, losing my mind. Like I, I, I could, it's like I, I could lose everything else, but I had lost my mind. Yeah. And that, I'd lost my children, you know, I'd lost everything, but yeah. I'd lost my mind and all of this yeah. as well. So I, so I didn't want that to ever happen again. So it was that step two. It was just like, yay! <laughs> I was all in, man. I was all and in. So I'm interested. I mean, I don't, I can't keep you too long, and I, I would love to hear the whole of the story of the rebuild. But, you know, instead of going through all of that, I am really interested in talking to you. In a, in a broader sense around this emotional healing and rebuilding and management or whatever you want to call it, which mm. is, you know, a huge part of the work of recovery. And yep. when we met at this hui a couple of weeks ago, we spoke briefly about anger and I said to you, it's a it's a not an emotion I'm very familiar with. I think I've squashed my anger down. I haven't mm. been oh, in touch yeah. with it. I don't use it. I don't feel it. I don't, mm. I don't yep. feel it. And, and, and why? Why don't I feel it? And it's something I'm working on at the moment, and it's hard for me because my default is being sad and crying. Right. Um, I thought, and you, did, you did say to me that, you know, anger was a part of your, you know, the, the end of your drinking story. There was anger coming out. How are you now with anger and what have you learned and what can you help me with anger? Not <laughs> anger. Well, this is, the, the, I think particularly as women in, in our generation, is that women, women, and I don't, don't like to sound too feminist here, but women aren't really often allowed to be angry in healthy yeah. ways. You know, we're not allowed to to show anger. We and we do, and we're, and so we we develop these horrible, passive aggressive, you know, nasty little ways of of um, doing anger, or we internalize it ourselves. And when I when I um you know had like I'm not even trying to live a, a um, an ordinary um, functional life. Oh my goodness! Every little hurt and every little unexpressed concern and every you know sort of failure and disappointment came out in, in total rage. So mm -hmm. I drink, and it was like a switch would go off, and I would just the red mist would come down, and I'd just be mm -hmm. filled with this inexplicable rage that that which was part of my letting loose, you know, and part of the violence. Yeah. Do you still yeah, get I, the sense of that now, or have you learned mm, to manage it? I, I don't get it at the intensity. So my emotion, my emotions um, throughout sobriety have um, I, I don't have those awful spikes. You know, the the dreadful yeah. lows, the intense rage. There's far more of that lovely middle ground of contentment and just that quiet I don't call it my quiet joy yeah. um and I don't need those extremes anymore mm. um and the way that but I sometimes use sometimes things you know sometimes things go wrong or treatment is bad or unfair and, and being angry is okay right I mean oh, do you still oh without a doubt but what, yeah what what I've tried what I try to do now with anger, I mean, hey, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm still, God, I can be a you know, <laughs> she devil from hell on a bad day, but I've become much, much better at explaining, you know, I'm like with my partner, Bruce, it's like instead of sort of erupting, though mm. I do do it, I, but I'll say, look, you've got to leave me alone right now. I'll explain where I'm at. Okay, with people, like, right. You've got to really give me some space now. I never used to explain or articulate yeah myself ever so yeah. when i'm if i'm angry about something nowadays i will try and articulate that in a way that is measured so yeah. if something and even out, doing that takes some of the heat out of it doesn't it oh because you're also saying it out loud to yourself you're you know is that do you acknowledge think it? It? well you've yeah. got to acknowledge it and i think a lot of our problems with emotions is lack of acknowledgement of our emotion and particularly mm. with the, the whanau i work with um, a lot of their um, sort of criminal, I guess, type behaviour stems from their inability to regulate their emotions. 
appropriately so that they're and they've hey you know anybody's got got any you know reason to be angry and, and disenfranchised and feeling pissed off with the world at someone who's homeless with no resources in the middle of the Auckland CBD yeah. so in many ways you can't kind of like point the finger oh you should just you know go and get a job yeah. <laughs> so, are you kidding me so um yeah um I don't it's yeah I, I prefer being angry to sad, Lotta. Mm. I, I prefer anger to sadness. Because um, because it's more active and more kind of, yeah. And I, I, try, yeah. I, try, and, um, I try and channel my anger now and um, like something will, if something's making me angry, I'll try and, ch like I'll write a letter to Auckland Council or, or I'll, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I'll, I'll try what can I do with this this energy? Yeah. Yeah. What can I do with this energy? Um, and sometimes it's just I'll go to the gym and, and lift some heavy weights. Yeah. You know, or I'll you know, go into the garden and pull the heads off my old dead roses. So um, there's nothing wrong with the emotion of anger. It's just how do we express it? Yes. And let, it, you know, let yourself be angry. And, you know, if, I had, if I had in my first marriage being able to articulate and express my hurt and anger, I'm sure we would have been a much healthier couple. Yeah. You know, I'm I not saying... Never, so. um, I probably need to go to a counsellor rather than talk, you know, <laughs> put this on you, but I just never feel angry. And, and there's, there's things I that I should be angry, like I'll say out loud, I should be angry about this and here's why I should be angry, but I'll be crying and feeling sad and hurt. Like, I still default to the sad and hurt. Anyway, this is my thing to work on. But I'm you see, my mum, my mum does that, Lotta. Yeah. And I just want to shake her and say, you, you get it. When she gets angry, even though she can, even if it's directed at me, I almost feel like a, <laughs> yes. Right, I'm going to work on this. Um, so, yeah. Before anger, we wrap anger, up. Can be, can anger, we... anger has resulted in all kinds of phenomenal social change for the better. Yeah, you're right. So don't, as women, I think, stop feeling sad. I mean, feel sad, you know, but yeah. don't take situations that should make you feel angry and turn it into sadness. It's just like. Yeah, um, yeah you're right. And there has been a few times recently where I've, I've felt sad, but I've also been like, you know what, I'm sick of this, and I've put a boundary in place. So maybe I am feeling a little bit of anger because I'm putting new boundaries in place around stuff I've dealt with my whole life, and maybe that is coming from a, a place of subtle anger. I don't know. Anyway, let's not analyze me any anymore. Um, before we wrap, I love, I love hearing about why why are people doing what they do or saying what they say. Or, are you sure was it your um, upbringing? Were you told you weren't nice girls? Don't you know? Get oh angry. yeah. Why are you so angry? Why are and you so I was angry? positioned in the family in a certain way. Anyway, let's not do this because <laughs> the table let's not do this here. We'll do it another time. <laughs> But I want to do want to hear a little bit more about your work before we wrap up because you talked about the Fano that you work with and I said in the intro that you're a court coordinator. So now yeah. you've come to a place yes. where you're losing your yes. legal training. Yeah. So I started off, you know, started back in the in the world working as a cleaner, you know. So right from the bottom, well, not the bottom, I don't, but but to, you know, very and in, in looking after other people's kids and. But learning to take some pride and learning to build, you know, building building my confidence, and part of it, part of that was going out and doing voluntary work and and being involved in organisations out in the community, um, which led kind of into politics. So everything's been a just a little stepping stone, stepping stone, stepping stone. Um, and I ended up doing a few years in social housing out in South Auckland, um, and got sort of quite interested in the social justice area of homelessness and lack of housing and how it contributes to to poor outcomes for people um because we know you know we've got we've got second third generation of people who are now growing up you know um or being born into um situations of you know their their entire fun now has been homeless essentially yeah. um so yeah um i absolutely i love my work i just love my work it, it's brought together all the various strands of uh, i i guess my life and my interests. I, um, I've always been really, really interested in, in hearing the stories of others, which is probably why AA resonated with me, you know, yeah. hearing and listening to the stories of others. So part of my role um, at Te Kurea Timitangahau is to 
um, assess people for suitability to come into our court. And part of that is sitting, we, we sit down and, and I'll talk to them and talk with them for about an hour or so and, and hope, you know, hopefully get their trust so, so that they can tell me their story um, wow. and, and to assess whether or not they're going to be um, suitable to come into the court and whether or not they've got that willingness there to, to make transformative change in their life. Because um, if there's one thing that I'm extraordinarily passionate about, it's transformative change because um, I've seen it, yeah. I've heard it, I've felt it in AA, I, you know, I, I know it's possible yeah. and I've, I've been through it myself. And although I'm, I'm still me, but there was a transformative change in me when yes. I got sober. Um, I am the same me, but I am a different version of me. And I do really feel that I've lived two different lives. So I believe that everybody has the capacity for transformative change. My um, my whanau come in and they're people who have no resources, right? And making change is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. So if we want to change people's criminal behaviour, we've got to, um, you know, enable them to access resources, um, so getting into things like getting them into some stable housing, getting some supports around them in terms of um, getting things like your basic documents, you know, your basic tools for human life um, yeah. that they often don't have. So no birth certificate, no Kiwi access card, no bank account. You know, they're often, they often don't even receive their benefit anymore because it's been stopped. Um, yeah, and just seeing what people are capable of when you just give them a bit of support. Mm. You know, in a, in a non-judgmental way, you just here you are. Right. Here's some tools. You know, we'll we'll support. And um, it's not just the the outward things. It's seeing the change within them. So you'll have yeah. someone who come in, um, very very defensive, very anti-authority, hates the world. You know, everything's negative, whatever. And then there'll be a little something there, and you think, yeah. That, that there's something there and you're just there you maybe you're talking about cars or maybe you're talking about music or maybe you're talking yeah. about you'll 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 find some little kernel of hope there that you you'll can see a little spark and you'll kind of like let let's focus on that and it's and it's just so rewarding to build a relationship of trust with someone yes. where you can say okay yeah let's give it a go Oh, and, oh. and I bet you they really respond to you kind of listening and hearing and seeing them, really seeing them. I, I hope so, Lotta. I mean, outwardly, you know, you can be very different to someone, like, but inwardly really understand them. And I think yeah. that's the beauty of um, the recovery community is that we know the emotions you're talking about. We understand your feelings, you know, we yeah. get it. And it's yeah. not about this and it's not about, you know, the brand of your shoes or your car, whatever. Mm. And it's that lovely thing that happens when you get people who have, um, they're either in addiction or, you know, deep in their alcoholism and they spend time with people in recovery and something really special happens. Mm. And it's hard to put a finger on it, but... You know, I've, I've sat in rooms, you know, very, very ordinary little church halls and things, and you can feel something. Oh, I know. There's a presence there, you know. I know. And there sometimes when I'm sitting in my funny little internal office um, and outside courtroom one, sitting there, and sometimes you can just feel, you know, there's something happening here. Yeah. And it's yeah, just, beautiful. it's an enormous privilege, you know. I just, oh. I just love it. I love it well, so much. How amazing that you're doing that, Mahi, now, and it's so rewarding and it's bringing together, like you say, all the strands of your life. And I'm just so, so happy for you that you've experienced that transformative change and that you've become, you know, the grounded, kind of wise, giving person that you always were, but that just had all those lost years. It's just been such a joy talking to you, Carmel, and I just so grateful for you opening up to us here at Living Sober and I know that our members you know are really going to enjoy watching this because like I said to you you know many of them they're in those early stages and it's hard work and we just oh, want to yeah. say keep going keep please going persevere. <laughs> please persevere I did I have you know before um before we go I, I this is my diary 
that I um I did in my first year of oh, sobriety. Wow. And I just and, and the the tumult of emotions and how much I miss drinking. Oh. And, and I just I I I want to go back to say to my early self, you know, hang in there because yeah. you have no idea how wonderful um your life can be living yeah. sober. Um I I just um I'm so grateful every single day. I, I, you know, I've got, I've got my, um, my family back. I've got, you know, I've got yes. grandchildren who, who I'm, I'm a safe person. You know, yes, um, you've got I'm yourself back. Person. That's the beautiful thing. You've got, yeah, yeah. How amazing! Look, mwah, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. I will um, share a link to the court if anyone wants to check out just the Wonderful, public yeah. site, the, what the work is that you do. But again. A really big, big thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the time, Lotta. It's always lovely to talk to to fellow people in sobriety. I yes. yeah, I can I can spend all day doing it. To be honest. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, yeah, when you next time you're in Auckland, you know, let's have a coffee and I'll, I'd I'll love look to. Up when I'm in Wally. <laughs> I'm okay, down there. Great. Right. So, yeah. Bye. Happy day.